Harbor APC Regional Chamber. And I want to thank everyone for being with us today. We have, uh, I think, a great program here with Jeff Donofrio, the Director of Michigan's Department of Labor and Economic Development. Um, a few very quick announcements. Just want to remind everyone that on Tuesday, June 9th, we, ha we have our COVID-19 Road to Recovery Summit event. That will be 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Attendees uh, for $40 will also receive a $20 gift card to some of our local restaurants. And we hope you will check out the program. It should be a great one. All the details we will be up on our website, a2ichamber.org. And I uh, look forward to that event and really to every chamber event because it, it gives us not just a chance to learn and, and hear from our speaker, but also a chance to hear uh, from a member who is uh, so kind to sponsor us. We cannot as a chamber do anything without the members that, that make us uh, successful and certainly those members that, uh, that help us with sponsorship around events. And it's my pleasure now to introduce Chris Simmons, who is the Business Services Program Manager, uh, along with a few other roles for AAATA, or as it's commonly known around here, uh, the RIDE. And Chris, I, I turn it over to you. Thank you again for your sponsorship. Oh, we're, we're pleased to do that. Thank you again, Andy. And uh, very glad you got the third A in there because the area matters. Um, just a few brief comments. You know, I'm sure everyone's aware that the rides reduced service uh, 70 to 75% due to the governor's stay at home orders. Uh, trying to emphasize that only our essential trips should be taken on transit. Uh, but this does include workers getting to their jobs at the locations that remain open. Uh, that's just one part of what we're trying to do. That includes no fare collection until we can find a safe way to do so. Um, requiring our drivers and our customers to wear a mask if they're medically able reducing the number of people who can ride at any one time to uh, promote and maintain physical distancing. Some of you may be calling that social distancing. We're trying to use the term physical distancing because we should still be social, just six feet apart from one another. Um, we've added a, a plexiglass barrier to separate the drivers and the customers. Uh, we're doing uh, uh, tons of extra cleaning on the buses while they're, they're in service and at the garage. Uh, and we're not likely to open our transit centers until we're confident we have measures in place to protect both our customers and our employees. Um, just like many of you, we are also being faced with lost revenue. Uh, in our case, that's a loss of $600,000 a month from our fares and an uncertain state funding situation moving forward, which uh, vastly contributes to our operations. Um, on top of all of that, I think we're all raising a number of questions as to what the community will look like as we reopen in stages. You know, how comfortable will people be sharing their space with others? Uh, what will it take for the community to be comfortable sharing public spaces again? Uh, do we face another round of closures this fall? How many businesses are going to reopen, whether it's just to their workforce or to customers as well? What sort of permanent shifts are we going to see in things like working from home, curbside retail, online orders? And what's the real estate footprint uh, necessary for businesses to do all of these things? And kind of most importantly, I think for all of us, what does our business community look like on the other side of this pandemic? Uh, we at The Ride are working on a next set of service changes to be implemented this August, uh, continuing the focus on serving those essential workers in their essential destinations, but with an increase in service to provide frequent enough service to promote that physical distancing uh, but maintaining our flexibility uh, flexibility and resiliency to respond to the conditions as they change in the community. Um, our overall goal is we've got to protect everybody. This is all the same community, and we have to be sure that we're meeting as many of those needs in a balanced manner as we possibly can. And our hope in sponsoring events like this is that we can together find the ways that all of the segments of our community can support each other, uh, our end in transportation, workforce development, finance, real estate, retail, tech, advertising, uh, sir, uh, general personal services, all of the segments of our business community can uh, work together to support the whole of our community. Uh, we are both a participant in these conversations as well as subject to the decisions that the community as a whole makes. And we don't have any better answers than anybody else right now. Uh, but we are a partner with all of you in figuring out what comes next. So our hope is that we are back to what all of us would recognize as something like a fully functioning community in the fall of 2021. But we're very interested in seeing what all of you are doing moving forward and supporting those efforts. 
So Andy, thanks to you and Diane and the rest of the folks at the chamber for holding these dialogues and for being a partner with all of us in the community as we try to find the ways to move towards our next phase of recovery. Chris, thank you. And thank you again to the ride. You're uh, certainly a, an integral part of this community and we appreciate not just your uh, membership in the chamber and sponsorship of today's event, but frankly, the, the vital role you play in our community and our workforce. So thank you again. And we'll transition now into uh, our program. We are fortunate to have uh, Jeff Donofrio with us today. Uh, many of you had a chance to hear from Jeff directly at the headline lunch we held with him in December. Uh, Jeff has a, frankly, a rather remarkable job given the time we're in. He is the director of Michigan's Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity. And normally I would give a, a, a long-winded uh, introduction, but um, the truth is Jeff has been an incredibly busy member of the governor's cabinet uh, to begin with, but certainly within these last several months. And he's going to share a bit about us, a bit with us about where the state is at, a little bit about their phased reopening, um, and frankly, just a sense of, uh, of what Leo is working on. At the end of his presentation, we'll open it up for Q&A here. And uh, Mr. Donofrio, I want to both welcome you, but also thank you. I know these days your time is certainly at a premium. We appreciate you being back here with the, uh, with the regional chamber. And without anything else to say here, sir, I turn it over to you, Director Don Frio. Andy, thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you to Diane and Chris and, and all the, the members of the chamber who are on today. Um, you know, I was on with uh, Congresswoman Woman Dingles, um, I, I think weekly town hall now, she does telephone town hall. And uh, she said, I, I might have the worst uh, job in, uh, in all of Michigan. And uh, I would say it's, it's a tough job, uh, but it's, uh, I'm lucky to be able to help people uh, in this time of crisis. Um, let me give you just an overview of what uh, the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity does. And in this crisis, specifically what we're trying to accomplish. Um, so we have the workforce, uh, the economic development, the labor and the housing functions of state government. That's 16 different agencies. Um, about 3,600 staff, um, and, uh, and really um, the, the goal of trying to help bend curves up, upwards for the state of Michigan so that in 10 and 20 years, we're in a different place uh, than we are today economically. Um, you know, we have things like the 60 by 30 initiative to try to help more post-secondary uh, education uh, be accomplished in this state, to help 60% of our, our uh, adults in this state have a post-secondary degree uh, by 2030. Um, there are a lot of other things that uh, we've been doing before the crisis and that we do today uh, during this crisis that are trying to really preserve, um, you know, the opportunity that people have and expand that. Um, during the crisis, um, we have about four main functions. So the first is really to make sure that we're all driving down the spread of COVID-19, uh, that we're not having to have people or businesses make um, choices uh, that would put people at, at greater risk. Um, the second thing is to make sure that um, we are getting emergency support and protections in place for workers uh, and for um, particularly businesses, small businesses that are in our community. Um, the third is to make sure that workplace safety is preserved uh, throughout both those that are operating now uh, during this crisis that are um, in that critical infrastructure bucket, but then as we re-engage the economy, that there are workplace rules um, and guidelines they're going to keep us safe and have the, the latest um, information uh, or using the latest information from CDC and others on the epidemic itself and on how it spreads. And then fourth, it's really trying to plan for um, the recovery of our economy because we know that COVID-19 has likely pushed us into you know, a, a recession in some way. Um, we hope that it is, is a short-term recession, just like a hurricane-type disaster that we uh, can re-engage our economy and come back from quickly. Um, but we know that a lot of businesses and a lot of people are going to see um, different trajectories for themselves um, coming out of this crisis. And we want to make sure that we provide every possible way of, of supporting them um, and helping them to achieve what uh, is possible um, in the coming months. So I'm going to share my screen and talk more in depth about a few of these um, specifics. Uh, it looks like I am disabled from sharing my screen. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. So. Maybe someone could work on that and I'll uh, perhaps talk through it um, as we uh, get that taken care of. 
Okay, so why don't I go through and I'll, I'll talk through what's happening on unemployment insurance. And then if we can get the graphics working, um, we'll make sure to, to have that uh, brought up. But the first thing is that, um, you know, over 1.7 million Michigan workers have filed for unemployment insurance since March 15th. Uh, that puts us at about one in three Michigan workers having sought uh, some sort of un unemployment insurance during this crisis. Um, now, typically before the pandemic, we had about 5,000 claims per week. Uh, the high during the Great Recession was about 77,000 claims. Um, well, during this crisis, uh, we surpassed that high uh, even during the Great Recession, uh, now six weeks running. Uh, and the highest uh, level we got uh, in, in any given week was about 390,000 claimants. So you go from 5,000 to 390,000 uh, virtually overnight. Um, and you can imagine what the historic nature of that is. This is something that is unprecedented in the history of unemployment insurance, both in this country um, and here in Michigan. Now, initially, um, we, we reacted to this by doing a couple things, expanding eligibility, increasing benefits, and adding capacity to the system. So because we didn't want people to have to choose between an income uh, and uh, you know, potentially staying home while sick, um, or quarantined or immunocompromised, the governor's executive orders uh, initially starting March 15th expanded eligibility for unemployment insurance for those workers who were sick, who were quarantined, immunocompromised or caring for a loved one. Um, the CARES Act, which is the uh, federal act that was put in place at the end of March, expanded eligibility for those who were self-employed, who were independent contractors, who were gig economy workers, those who filed those 1099 uh, um, IRS forms. They also expanded for low wage workers and those with limited work experience. Um, the, we waived a number of different uh, requirements like registration at a Michigan works agency or office or, you know, work or, or look for, um, looking for work during this period of time while there is potentially no work available. Now, who continues not to be eligible are those individuals who are pulling down paid sick leave or other paid leave um, from their employer. Uh, those individuals who can telework with pay um, those individuals who quit work without good cause just to obtain unemployment insurance benefits. Now, the benefit weeks were expanded from 20 weeks to 39 weeks. Um, the additional pandemic unemployment assistance provided through the federal government adds $600 weekly to all beneficiaries through the end of July, um, and all of that is federally funded. Now, the benefits paid so far, um, we have paid $8.5 billion um, to Michigan workers. Um, and uh, again, the highest number of, of claimants being paid during the Great Recession was about 363,000. Um, we're at about a million uh, being paid uh, in any given week at this point. Michigan was one of the first states to pay the extra $600 in CARES Act benefits. We started paying that out on April 8th, and we were one of the first to really open up that um, self-employed independent contractor application on April 13th. Uh, most states, uh, particularly um, if you look at Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, it took them another month to open up those applications. Um, so while we know that uh, there are, are a lot of people still struggling to get um, uh, to get payments, you know, 90 about 94 percent of all the individuals who come in have gotten paid. But it's those those you know six percent that we're really concerned about that we continue uh, to try to figure out what we can do to make sure that uh, we are providing the emergency support that is needed for them and that we're not gonna rest until they get paid. Um, we've increased staff um, from about 130 on, on the phones dealing with customer issues uh, to about 1,000 now who are dealing with customers. Um, we're gonna be adding additional staff um, over the coming uh, days here. Um, and that's particularly because there are these, these common issues that are holding people up, non-monetary determinations where we're trying to determine eligibility for claims. Um, where there's potential um, locked accounts or someone has made a mistake while filing or cert certifying. And what unfortunate we, we had to announce yesterday was that there is a, a large amount of criminal activity uh, and criminals who are trying to uh, file imposter claims. Um, you know, they potentially have stolen information from other sites, from uh, other sources, and are trying to file claims on behalf of Michiganders, or they're using false information to try to make claims. That's unfortunately going to slow down some of the payments to people who are eligible here in Michigan. Uh, and as uh, Andy and my old boss would say, there's probably a hot place in hell for people who are trying to, criminals who are trying to take advantage of uh, systems and people in a crisis. Now, when we look at returning to work and the fact that there are a lot of people on unemployment right now, 
we're trying to find ways to get them back to work um, and do it in a way that is responsible. Um, it looks like I can share the screen, so I'm gonna put this on right now and we'll start with uh, the WorkShare program. So the way that we can get people back to work um, is uh, the WorkShare program. WorkShare is, is something the state of Michigan enacted um, within the last 10 years. Um, it really helps um, retain workforce in times of crisis. But during this COVID pandemic, it's also gonna help people bring, uh, and employers bring back from layoff individuals they've had to put on unemployment. Um, we'll go about uh, how, how it uh, works in just a second, but most employers qualify for work share. There's no requirement for a work history. That was uh, something that we waived during executive orders uh, the governor put in place. Uh, there's no requirement to have a positive balance with UIA. Um, we've allowed uh, part-time workers who are regular workers at, at an employer, uh, with employers to uh, file as well for this program. And the way it works is an, an employer signs up their employees for work share. Um, and they can, uh, if they have to reduce that person's hours and wages by as little as 10% or as much as 60%, what they will get is a portion of their unemployment benefits to make up the difference in what their, uh, their reductions have been. So from uh, uh, now until the end of July, individuals will get a portion of their Michigan benefit, the $600 in pandemic unemployment assistance, um, and uh, that'll be added to the weekly wages that they get from their employer. So those who have filed and gotten the Paycheck Protection Program are eligible to participate in WorkShare. It's likely you just have to structure your, your WorkShare program, which it's very flexible to, to put in place, um, uh, to make sure that you can get full forgiveness if that's what you're looking for from the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, so let's give an example of how WorkShare works. Now, if you're an employer who um, is trying to retain your workforce, Let's say you have 100 people that you're enrolling in the program. The average salary is $52,000 a year, $1,000 weekly. You've had to, because of um, the business reduction you've had and the customer demand reduction you've had, you've had to reduce hours and salaries of those employees by 60%. WorkShare provides 40%. Uh, of course, you get 40% of, of their uh, salary as an employee already from the employer. WorkShare provides 60% of the state unemployment benefits, that's $217 in this case, plus $600 of the pandemic unemployment assistance through July. So an employer can uh, have earnings of $1,200 uh, through the end of July. Um, so they get a little bit higher uh, earnings than they even did um, at 100% of wages and hours. The employer is able to save $720,000 in payroll uh, for that uh, period of time from May through July. Now for bringing people back to the economy, let's take that same example of 100 employees uh, that are making uh, $52,000 a year, 1,000 uh, weekly. Let's say that uh, business capacity is, um, at, for a re-engaged company is about 65% of pre-crisis. And so this company is, is offering 65% of wages and hours to their employees to come back to work. That would be about $650 weekly. Um, they would have to choose between that or continuing on their unemployment insurance benefits, which would, uh, through July would be $962. Obviously, that would be a, a tough situation for an employer to try to attract those employees back. With WorkShare, though, uh, individuals receive that 65% of their salary. They receive an additional 35% of their unemployment insurance benefits, $126 in this case, plus the $600 of pandemic unemployment assistance through July, which gives them almost $1,400 of weekly earnings uh, through the uh, end of July versus the unemployment benefits of $962. So you can see how this program would quickly be able to re-engage uh, portions of a workforce, portions of our economy in a faster way, in a way that um, would be uh, helping employers bring back uh, employees who may be even uh, nervous about coming back to work. So to find out more about the WorkShare program, you can go to michigan.gov slash WorkShare. Again, michigan.gov slash WorkShare. Um, there's a lot of uh, good tutorial videos um, and ways that employers can find out how to put individuals uh, on their payroll on WorkShare uh, rather immediately. So let's talk return to work um, and what that looks like. So the way when we um, you know, try to look at the decision making about return to work, and really these are public health decisions. Um, so these are being made by uh, public health professionals. But there's, there's a, a matrix really between epidemic risk and workplace risk. And we're trying to gauge um, both uh, of those factors when we decide uh, what happens and when. So if you look at, you know, are we ready to restart um, from an epidemic side of things, 
you're looking at the spread. Have we flattened the curve? Um, have we found ways to make sure that um, the density, the trajectory of the spread has been, um, has been handled? Um, and have we done that for a period of time, which shows us that uh, there's not uh, a potential uh, to have a, a, a spike and a bloom? Uh, the question on healthcare system capacity. Um, do we have the uh, personnel, the beds, the ventilators, the PPE uh, that's necessary to really safely diagnose and treat patients? Um, testing, of course, is very important in that uh, calculation. And then from the public health capacity, can we track and isolate um, when individuals return to work effectively when there is a spike or a bloom? Um, are we able to do contract tracing? Are we able to isolate and quarantine and have testing, um, particularly on the job? Now, for the workplace itself, you're looking at um, the risk factors by worker interaction. Does that worker interact with the general public? Um, does that work, uh, worker have contact with their co coworkers at, uh, in the normal course of, of business? Are they sharing equipment, computers, um, you know, copiers, tooling, or machinery? Is, what's the workplace characteristic? Is it indoor or outdoor? Are there a large number of workers? Is that density very high per square foot? Do they have to travel between workplaces? Um, and is there enough um, sanitation facilities and is the airflow good enough within the actual workplace uh, to minimize the spread? And then what's the worker type themselves? Um, is there a certain uh, demographic uh, that represents this work, uh, workplace or are there pre-existing conditions? Is there you know, um, a high propensity potentially for immunity or, or for exposure, um, particularly outside of work? Um, do they take public transit? Because that could, of course, uh, be a risk factor. And we know that um, uh, the good people over at the ride and others are working to make sure that that's uh, de-risked as well. But um, we have to put that all into the calculation of when things open and how. Um, now, the Merck um, put together, uh, this is a group of business leaders and healthcare leaders, put together sort of a, a regional approach to how we analyze this. So, if we look at commuting patterns, who is interacting with each other by region, um, you can see uh, that there's public health reporting regions and certainly public health systems. Uh, we wanna make sure that they have the right capacity um, that's in place. Um, and then you look at, uh, of course, um, uh, what the Merck put together as the regions based on a, a combination of those things. Now we use all of that and we take then an industry and we try to put a risk profile to that industry. Again, is the worker interaction, is the workplace itself high, medium, low, or minimal risk? And then is there something we can do um, that would help move something that's a high risk activity into a lower risk category? Uh, that's things like organizational administrative controls, uh, trying to make sure that there's the right education and training, trying to make sure that there are responsible parties on site who are monitoring this uh, at a workplace on a regular basis that there's access controls, that we're making sure that visitors may not be allowed in manufacturing facilities, that we're reducing the number of meetings and travel between workplaces, that we're taking temperatures potentially um, upon an entry, um, and that we're measuring whether or not uh, there are symptoms um, in our workforce. It's reorganizing a, a workplace to make sure that there's distancing, there's uh, separation barriers, that we reduce occupancy um, in high density environments when possible that there's additional sanitation and cleaning, um, that there's maybe higher ventilation if that's possible, that we're uh, installing additional hand washing and hand sanitation stations, and that we're putting PPE requirements in place, um, especially for workers, but also for customers. Um, and there, there are masks and facial coverings and others that are required. So uh, that all adds up to what the governor announced in terms of the six phases. Most of the state um, is in phase three, which is a flattening right now. We know that uh, case growth is declining um, generally and that um, there's continued distancing and, and increased uh, you know, uh, use of PPE. Um, we're really as a state moving into phase four right now and, and probably on the cusp in many regions of going into phase four, although there are a few, uh, particularly in West Michigan, um, which are seeing an increase to cases, which is uh, concerning a bit and may, may lead to um, still portions of the state staying in phase three. Um, you know, phase four is really going to have where, uh, an ability to open up more locations, uh, to have more gatherings. Um, then you see phase five is really that containing, and phase six is really when we have uh, secured a, um, some sort of immunity, um, whether that's a vaccine or, or other mechanisms uh, to make this not as risky of a, uh, a pandemic. 
So for tracking of, of those phases, folks can go to mystartmap.info. That can show you uh, in real time what the epidemic spread, the test results, the new cases, the deaths, um, and some of the other factors that are going into um, what phase a region or a, a county is in. Uh, again, my start, uh, uh, mystartmap.info. Um, I'll, I'll pause here and then uh, be happy to take some questions, Andy. Thank you, Jeff. We, we appreciate that information. Um, I want to let folks know that the Q&A uh, is open via the, uh, the, the control on your Zoom uh, monitor there. Uh, Director John Afrio, maybe one question just to open up with is, we have an abundance of restaurants here in Washtenaw County, uh, as, as you well know, Ann Arbor, Ypsilanti, be it Main Street in Ann Arbor, Depot Town in Ypsilanti. Um, a lot of folks are wondering when we can get back to uh, sort of the notion of eating out as, as, as we could pre-COVID. And what we're also wondering is, is, is your best guess that the, that the dining experience is going to be different uh, over the next six months, a year or so, in terms of, of what it was before, either lower density, lower capacity, or, or something else? Sure. Uh, so I would say a, a couple things. First, the timing of when things um, come back into re-engagement with the economy, when we can uh, you know, re-engage restaurants, is really a public health question. And so uh, that's something that public health professionals at the governor and the governor's office um, we'll announce um, and we'll be able to talk about. Uh, that's that phased approach that you see. From a, a safety perspective, that's where, um, you know, when something is determined to come back in uh, safely because of the epidemic risk, um, that's where my OSHA and my department comes in to make sure that we have the guidelines in place, the, um, the mechanisms in place that are gonna keep people safe on the job, but then also keep customers safe too. So when you look at restaurants, of course, um, and you look at um, what has happened in Northern Michigan, I think it's a good indicator of how that will come into um, the phased approach here in Southeast Michigan and uh, throughout the state, where you will likely have more out outdoor dining options that'll be allowed first. Um, depending on the, the risk of epidemic spread, um, then you might likely get um, additional dining indoor options, but you're gonna try to reduce the capacity because again, the, there is no prevention of, of spread of this disease other than social distancing right now. And so having uh, groups of, of uh, tables that have six feet worth of distance, increasing ventilation. Um, so if you have uh, you know, those windows and doors you can open uh, to make sure there's more ventilation internally um, into the, the restaurant, that's likely gonna be what is recommended. Um, you know, it's difficult because in a restaurant situation, of course, um, you're having to remove any face coverings uh, to eat and drink um, and uh, so, um, you know, that's why restaurants in particular are going to be a, a different scenario, I think, than some other retail locations. Um, for other retail and for other, um, you know, activities that are even uh, in, in operation now, grocery stores and such, you know, face coverings are required for everyone uh, coming into that building um, in an enclosed environment. Uh, we know that there's, um, you know, variations in, in who is uh, complying with that, but face coverings, um, you know, they do provide some protection to you, but really it's protecting other people from you. So when we talk about face coverings, um, you know, I always think of this as, I'm not wearing this face covering for me, I'm wearing it for my grandparents. I'm wearing it for the people in the community who are, are more vulnerable than others. Um, and so in the healthcare workers, the first responders, the, you know, the, the workers who are on the front lines right now um, in those sometimes low wage jobs um, who are at greater risk. So uh, those are the individuals we're wearing those, those face coverings for. Um, there will be other rules, and uh, MyOSHA is going to be launching a website actually tomorrow that helps um, uh, consolidate a lot of those guidelines and rules for small businesses in particular. Andy, we'll make sure we, we get that out to your membership so you can see it. But you can go to michigan.gov slash leo and find those, those guidelines now, uh, particularly for restaurants and other retail locations. Um, they can begin uh, to start adjusting their facilities and preparing for this, uh, this reopening. Thank you, Director Donofrio. And we, we had two questions come in while you're speaking. The, the first one, hopefully, is relatively easy, and that is, uh, could we share this presentation 
uh, with our with our membership post presentation. Is that something that we could do? Of course. Wonderful. Um, the second question that's come in, and I think many people have had uh, s some form of this question, which is, is there any way to reach a person or have a chat or even leave a message for a callback when they inquire about the PUA claims? Uh, it, it, it seems in this person's instance that, that it's just not possible to connect with, a, with an operator in the system. Any, mm -hmm. any feedback on that? Yeah, you know, we, um, there's a couple of things first. So we've added a lot of people on the phone lines. Um, and, and like I said, gone from about 130 people dealing with customers at the beginning of this crisis to about 1,000 right now, in addition to training some of our third party uh, partners in the community of how to solve simple problems. The issue is that um, for those who are caught up in the system for non-monetary issues, haven't been paid out yet. These are usually complex um, issues that take an experienced UIA staffer who understands the eligibility and the guidelines both at the federal level and at the state level. And so we have a limited number of those individuals who can deal with customer issues. Um, so simply getting through to someone, even on the phones, if we added more bodies to the phones, wouldn't necessarily get you an answer to your question. In most cases, it probably wouldn't. Um, but what you can do if you're looking to contact us, if you're looking to um, inquire with us is you can submit a, an email through your MyWAM account. That's the account you create for unemployment insurance. That email then goes into a, a, a queue, which is answered by the, um, the adjudicators uh, and the staff at uh, the unemployment insurance agency. Um, if you're having an issue with account locks, there's a, a form to fill out immediately that um, will get you to a certain subset of a team um, that will unlock your account or find a way to help you with your IT issue. Um, but again, if you're having a more generalized issue, please send an email through your MyWAM account. If you are a victim of identity theft, or if you think you're, uh, there has been an imposter claim filed on your behalf, there is, uh, you go to michigan.gov slash UIA, there is a link to file a identity theft report. Um, that's important for us so that we make sure we stop payment um, or we, we prevent payment from going out. Um, and that we uh, also take that off of your account in case you have to file unemployment insurance in the future, because a, a imposter claim, unfortunately, could hold up your eligibility. Thank you. Um, we have a, a, a question coming in that says, thank you for mentioning the fraud issue. There seems to be a recent spike in fraudulent claims being filed with uh, UIA. And do we have any sense how, uh, the, for lack of a better term, the, the bad guys are getting names and social security, social security numbers? Is, and is there anything more that employers can do to mitigate that risk? Yeah. Uh, so a couple of things. You know, it, what we have seen is a, a U.S. Secret Service memo that came out um, about a week and a half ago now uh, that indicated that states around the country were being targeted by international crime rings and by um, criminals here in the United States. Um, you know, part of the, the challenge here is that uh, the new pandemic unemployment assistance program um, provides uh, lower barriers to entry, right? Um, in, in the state system, for instance, if you file for a state claim, we are sending a letter to your employer and to you verifying that you are eligible. Your employer has a chance to dispute your eligibility, which oftentimes uh, catches a uh, potential fraudulent claim. Um, that's not happening with pandemic unemployment assistance because if you're an independent contractor or if you're self-employed, there's no employer to check that uh, you are eligible or have been laid off. Um, there are other mechanisms that we're using to try to prevent uh, these, these imposter uh, filings, but I think we all know and we all have seen over the years here that there are data breaches in um, Equifax, in credit card companies, in other databases, where it's very clear that you know, our, our personal identifying information, our, our addresses, our social security numbers, um, are often in the hands of, of criminals on the dark web. Um, and what happens in that case is that uh, all it takes is some criminal pulling that down, getting enough information about you, um, about your, your employment, uh, and then filing a claim on your behalf. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, law enforcement nationally and in Michigan are coordinating um, as we try to analyze uh, the situation and, and prevent this from happening. For those individuals, again, who, um, you know, it happened to former Lieutenant Governor Brian Kelly today that um, 
someone filed a claim on his behalf and had his full social security number um, and a home address and, and used that to put in a fake claim. Um, you know, he was able to, uh, to stop that and um, file a report with us. Uh, but again, I think it's that education we do with our employees so that they all know what to do if an imposter claim is filed. Um, and uh, it's, it's something we just unfortunately have to be hyper vigilant about. And criminals, you know, it's the, the sorry state of, uh, of the world at times where criminals want to take advantage of crisis situations and vulnerable people. Director Donofrio, toward, toward that line of thinking, you mentioned uh, sort of the old process by which you could catch fraudulent claims through yeah. uh, the dual letter to, to the individual and the employer. Um, is it your advice then that employers need to, to sort of fairly regularly watch their UIA notices to make sure that they either verify or, or reject them and sort of take that proactive step? Certainly, if someone is filing a fake claim, um, an imposter claim and an employer is getting a letter for it because they have filed for state unemployment benefits. Um, you know, an employer should take that seriously and, and make sure to provide us information that that claim is, is not valid. Um, and that, you know, there is a, a potential fraud happening. Um, there is a, a place to, to uh, submit a form on that, but they should also go into their MyWAM account um, and uh, indicate that that is not a valid claim. Um, so we can go back and adjudicate that and, uh, and get that off the record of the individual because we don't want individuals to be harmed in this process. And unfortunately, um, you know, that's what, what could occur if, uh, if a fake claim is put in and then an individual becomes unemployed. Um, they will have to uh, verify their identity and have to likely go through an adjudication process. Good information to know. Uh, one of the questions that we get at the chamber uh, frequently is, what, what is the best advice to give businesses in terms of a written plan for safety within their operations? As, as you mentioned in the presentation, mm -hmm. you, you, you have to marry sort of public health, economic uh, activity, uh, and, and a host of other factors into this. Is there a place on your website or is there standard advice that you think businesses should have in hand in terms of putting together a written safety plan for re reopening and re-engaging. Sure. Yeah, there, there actually is a requirement to have one of these plans in place um, and available to your uh, employees and customers as we re-engage the economy. Um, what I'll do here, Andy, is I'm gonna share the website that we are launching tomorrow uh, so that folks can, can see this, if I can uh, get it up here. Okay, um, if folks can see this, it's um, the website itself uh, is, uh, I'm gonna get the website here, is michigan.gov slash COVID workplace safety. That's COVID, C-O-V-I-D, workplace safety, uh, all written out. Um, and the website that you see, um, hopefully here, uh, shows you that, um, uh, it, it has uh, guidelines for uh, individuals' uh, workplace safety um, by industry. Um, it has uh, some instructional videos that you could show to your employees um, and employers can watch on how to um, uh, adjust their workplaces to be safe. But it also has sample exposure control plans um, for low to medium risk um, employees. That's what you're going to have to put in place um, as you reopen. And so you can download that. You can alter it to your needs. Um, and then you have a, a reopening checklist, um, some additional posters and, and safety guidelines. Uh, so I highly suggest folks um, visit that uh, if, if it's possible. And Director Donofrio, when you, when you thank you for, for this website and we will make that available with the, with the presentation. Um, obviously, given the, the wide swath of different types of businesses, uh, are these, are these uh, written guidelines or rather documents that need to be produced? As you said, they need to be shared or available to employees. And is, is there any requirement to share that written information with the state or, or with some other entity? Or is it simply to have on hand written out in, in, in shareable form? So there's no requirement to send it to the state. Um, but if there is a complaint, if there is a, an issue uh, that we have to look into from MIOSHA, um, we will likely ask you for that, that plan. 
Um, and that will be one of the first uh, pieces of the investigation we'll go through to see if you've produced this plan and if you've, you've consciously looked at your workplace safety. Um, again, it does need to be available to employees, but also customers who might be coming in um, to, your, um, uh, to your place of business. Um, you know, there is, is some leeway in terms of when you get that plan in place. We know that this is not something you can put in place immediately. Um, and generally, when we, we look at what, how we judge a workplace to be safe, um, we're trying to seek compliance. We're not trying to be punitive in this. And so we're looking to see, have you made your best effort? Um, and are you, you acting um, in a way uh, to make sure that um, uh, you're doing what's possible to make this workplace safety for your employees and for your customers. So for instance, you know, we know that PPE at times have not been available, the N95 masks or something like that. That might be the way that you know, a grocery store worker is, is most protected. But if, if an N95 mask is not available, doing things like putting um, you know, barriers between the individual and the customer, um, making sure that they have uh, cloth masks available to them, might be a suitable alternative while we await uh, the greater production of N95 masks. You know, it's, it's that type of activity that, um, again, it shows that you're trying to implement, and we think the vast majority of people and businesses are trying to do the right thing here. Um, that's why we're trying to make it easy to have this website so you can understand, uh, so you can find some guidelines, uh, some checklists, and then also have some sample um, uh, plans in place that uh, don't make you try to put this together from whole cloth. We look to your website for general best practices, have the plan written out and shareable for employees and, and customers. And while there's not a, a certainly a punitive intent or, or a proactive verification, it's the sort of thing you, a business should have on hand, should have ready. Um, and, and the state, if I'm hearing you correctly, understands there needs to be some adaptability given the, the wide array of different yeah. uh, endeavors businesses are in. Good, good information uh, yeah. to know. Uh, Director Donofrio, we had a, a comment, I guess, come in that uh, was in support for the WorkShare program. I should also note the, the Chamber is making use of the WorkShare program. And yeah, part of, the, uh, part of the, the positive reaction here deals with the $600 per week uh, additional funding from the, from the feds. Is the assumption safe then that that six hundred dollar per week supplement will go away uh, on July July thirty first? Is that is that your best assumption at this point? Um, it's the week ending July twenty sixth. Just just to be clear, uh, it's the last full week in, in July. But the assumption is right now it is scheduled to go away, um, and the the House um, in the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, has passed a bill that would extend that to the end of the year. Um, in, in addition to the $600 of, of pandemic unemployment benefits um, for individuals on unemployment through the end of the year. Um, the Senate is still considering it, so there is a possibility that it is extended, um, but at this point, uh, there does not appear to be as much support in the Senate for this provision. Um, about 28 states have work share programs right now, so it's not a universal program across the country. Um, and, you know, when we talk to colleagues in other states, um, they have not yet, I think, used WorkShare or those who even have WorkShare have not um, put WorkShare in place um, and marketed it in the same way that Michigan is. Um, while it's, it's clear that the pandemic unemployment assistance is available, um, I, I think it's not something that um, some systems are able to deal with right now, uh, partially because they have their head down trying to pay the individuals on unemployment that have registered in historic numbers. Um, and Michigan it has been generally ahead of the game in terms of paying people, um, you know, in a, a way that is faster um, and that is at a higher rate. Um, but, you know, we have, we have tried to market this differently. We talked to one state in the Midwest who didn't have a work share program who, because of it ending this pandemic unemployment assistance ending in July, um, said, you know, gosh, we would love to put one in place. We would do that in the next couple of months, but it just doesn't seem worth it um, given the fact that it's, it's ending so shortly. So if this were to expand, um, and what I'd urge, you know, Andy and, and Diane and others um, who are associated with national groups um, that are associated maybe or, or have partners in other states where there are um, Republican senators in particular, um, you should be talking about work share. You should be talking about how important it is to you and to include that in whatever next stimulus bill comes out if you think this is a, is a good program. I, I really think the next, you know, through the end of the year, 
it is likely a significant amount of businesses have reduced customer demand. Um, whether that results in, in reduced work, um, you know, workforce or the need to reduce uh, salaries is, is a question for that business. But WorkShare provides a win-win for those individuals who we want to stay engaged in the workforce and for the business who wants to maintain and, and get to 100% of their capacity pre-COVID as quickly as possible. So, you know, the longer that that, that is available, um, we think it's going to be a, a really, you know, important program to restart Michigan and get our economy back up and running as quickly as possible. Share, share uh, thoughts or, or support for the program with uh, our federal legislators, or if we have friends and family or business colleagues in other states, share, share it with their senators. Um, share, share it with the Andy Labars of Ohio and Kentucky and, uh, you know, the other people who are working at chambers. And then, you know, uh, many of us are associated with national organizations. Um, and so these national organizations who are, are talking about the stimulus as well, um, we should try to, uh, to, you know, talk to them about the importance of this program. So if the National Manufacturing Association, if, you know, the National Chamber or the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, if, you know, other groups like that are saying WorkShare is a valuable program, um, it will, will register on the radar differently than if it's just uh, one state. Well, I want to assure folks, uh, there are no Andy Labars I'm aware of in Ohio, but your, your point is well taken, Director Donofrio. And we, we have another uh, question that came in. This is someone who's affiliated with the Kiwanis Club here in Ann Arbor, and they want to know, are there any specialized guidelines for thrift shops? Um, that's that's uh, uh, an on-the-spot question for you, Director Donofrio, but any, any reaction there? I think they would be categorized the same way as any retail location. Um, and so there are guidelines on that michigan.gov slash COVID workplace safety uh, website. If, uh, if you go there and look at retail locations, you'll see the guidelines that we're, um, uh, we're proposing for those retail locations. And I would say this too, um, just on guidelines and on rules and things that, that are in place, we know that we're learning things still daily about COVID-19 and, and the spread and risk um, and so they may change. Um, and we know that it, it sometimes is, there's a, a lag in education or awareness. Um, that's why we're trying to put out these resources um, in one place and trying to you know, issue uh, updates to organizations like the Chamber who can get them uh, to businesses as quickly as possible. Another question that's come in and is maybe related to that previous question. Um, can nonprofits, particularly nonprofits that would, that would take uh, item donations, you think of your Habitat for Humanity res resale stores and so forth, can they adapt the guideline that, that, that you will have listed on the website tomorrow? Is that something that they could use in terms of interaction with, with donors? You know, I think, again, they would fall into retail locations, right, where, where customers are, whether they're exchanging by giving or, or by purchasing. Um, the guidelines for retail locations need to be followed. Um, and, and certainly, um, you know, the general guidelines for workplaces and for uh, the health and safety of individuals where we need to maintain six feet of distance, we need to have face uh, masks and coverings, uh, we need to make sure that there's uh, hygiene stations, hand washing stations available, uh, I think would, would be uh, applicable in this case too. So if there's a you know, a place where people are coming to donate um, individual items when, when we're able to reopen retail um, in the way that uh, the phasing, uh, the phased approach uh, allows, um, you know, making sure that there's maybe a hand washing station at where you're donating, um, making sure that there's, um, you know, perhaps hand sanitizer available, that you're marking off um, where people have to stand and, and the six foot distance between uh, individuals to make sure that they are not, um, uh, you know, getting in too close a contact with others who could have uh, this this virus and not know it. Make sure it's clear that when um, people come into their shop, that again, not only are face masks required, but if you're showing any of these symptoms, which are are you know associated with COVID, that you're not allowing them in or you're telling them to please wait for you know a certain period of time uh, to come back in. Those are the types of things we have to do and have to really become the social norms uh, for us um, where we're all expecting it. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's part of a, 
a sea change here. I know that when I first put on uh, a mask and started walking outside with it, I felt a little uncomfortable. Right? I didn't feel like that was a natural thing. But over the last you know few weeks, it's it's become a, a way of life. Common common sense and check michigan.gov slash COVID workplace safety for yeah. uh, for best practices and useful information. And Director Donna Frio, maybe uh, time for one last question. And <laughs> we won't ask you to predict the future, but can you tell us if there are any plans at, at the state or within Leo in terms of how we might handle a resurgence in in the fall or in the coming winter? Uh, obviously, we, we don't know if that will happen, but are, are there contingency plans you are looking at or, or considering? Yeah, you know, I think uh, it is very possible um, that there would be a, a spike in infections and a resurgence of this. And so you, you can look at these restrictions um, that have been put in place and now are being dialed back as truly a dial, right? They can be dialed back up if, if we see um, further public health risk. Um, I think the, the importance that we have of continuing to expand testing, um, to ex continue to make sure that, that we are not lax on enforcing and following these guidelines and rules um, will help us minimize that risk. But the worst thing you know, that we can have happen to us in the next few months is that all this sacrifice, all this pain and suffering that we've had from a health perspective and an economic perspective is, is in vain when uh, people start letting their guard down. Um, until there is a vaccine, until there is a treatment or some way to prevent this, um, or you know, as, as healthcare providers have talked about herd immunity, um, there is, is going to be a risk here. And it's going to, you know, I think, be dependent on all of us trying to do our bit. Um, you know, this is our, our you know, greatest generation moment um, where you know, the, uh, our grandfathers and, and great grandfathers and um, you know, during World War II, uh, they went on the front lines and fought and on the home front, they were rationing. They were planning victory cards. They were doing lots of things to make um, you know, do with, with the situation they found themselves in. Um, we find ourselves in a, a crisis situation, which is a generational moment for us. Um, and so it's important for us all to, to take this seriously um, and make sure that um, you know, it's, it's not just our uh, momentary desires or, or frustrations uh, that we, we pay attention to, but what is it going to be in, in six months, eight months, 12 months for those members of our community who are more at risk and for you know, our family and friends, um, how that we, we can keep them safe and hopefully get to a place where we have a vaccine and uh, get back to normalcy. Well, and, uh, well, well said. We, uh, you know, I think everyone is anxious to get back to a to a pre-COVID norm, and that that may be years away, if 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 ever. And I think uh, our members have consistently understood the the need for public safety and 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 for uh, the importance of ensuring uh, the community can stay strong. Uh, not just economically, but but physically and from a health perspective, we uh, sure. we appreciate that. Director Donna Frio, thank you so much for being with us today, and 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 generally for uh, your your help on these issues. Any any closing thoughts that you would like to leave us with, or or, or that we should hear? You know, I I think Michigan and Michiganders are resilient, and and we have shown that time and time again. Um, I have full confidence that we're going to get through this together and, and that there is light at the end of this tunnel. Um, you know, there's, we're still in, in the thick of it, but, you know, as Winston Churchill said, when you're going through hell, keep going. Uh, so we've got to make sure that um, we, we stay together, we do the right things, um, we help each other, we're patient with each other, we're kind to each other, uh, and lend that extra helping hand um, in, this, in this time of crisis. Um, I appreciate everything, Andy, you're doing, Diane is doing, and, and all the folks on the call are doing today, both in your community and, and for uh, businesses, employers, and customers. Well, we certainly appreciate your willingness to be with us. That's a, a fantastic message to end on. I do want to thank uh, the RIDE for sponsoring us today. Uh, for everybody who, who was able to participate, we will make this information available in this uh, this this Zoom meeting available via our website, but uh, one more time for you, Director Donna Frio. Thank you 
uh, for being with us today and thank you also for for the service these are tough and challenging times and uh, we we appreciate your willingness to step into the breach here uh, to mm -hmm. everyone to everyone here thank you for being with us uh, please check a2ychamber.org for updates and information including from uh, leo and other important agencies and uh, until next time via zoom or or uh, so forth we will see you then thank you for your your membership here in the chamber